Good evening, everyone. First off, I wanna go ahead and show my appreciation and say thank you to everyone who has joined us this evening. Um, you guys have taken time out your day to join us in this discussion around social justice and allies. We've put together an amazing panel of men and women who we'll all get to hear from tonight. I encourage everyone to let your voices be heard. Please utilize the chat box for any questions or concerns you may have. I want us, I want to give as much time to all of us um, to uh, let our voice be heard. So um, I want us to build together. So please let's, um, if you have people who you know who need to hear this or who haven't, who wasn't able to join tonight, please um, join this conversation and please utilize that chat box. Um, so with that being said, I'm eager to hear what they all have to say as well as what you all have to say. So I will briefly introduce myself. I will introduce the panelists. Um, and then after that, we can you know get right into the nitty gritty. So with that being said, my name is Devontae Springer. I'm 24 years old. I'm currently serving as a California justice leader with Impact Justice and AmeriCorps. Um, I am currently helping recently incarcerated youth in the DJJ system receive their honorable discharge certificate. Um, with that, I'm also an MBK mentor and facilitator right here in Sacramento. And along with that, I also serve with the Robertson Family Development Center as an after school um, instructor, as well as a, a Freedom School summer school instructor. So that's me, Devontae Springer. Without further ado, I wanna pass it off to the panelists. We are going to go ahead and start with Brother Kariga. Please introduce yourself. Peace, good people, how we doing? I am Kariga Bailey. I am honored to be present under the circumstance that we are able to convene, hold space, build community for a topic as such. I am a, um, a father, an angel parent. I'm an artist, a creator, an educator, a servant. Uh, I look forward to being able to add value to this conversation um, through the lens of love, empathy, exceptionalities. Uh, just really build a bridge from maybe where some of us are uh, to where the common ground is. Again, I'm Kariga Bailey. I'm looking forward to be a part of the discussion and uh, learn and add value. All right, thanks Kariga. Next, let's introduce Ellen. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ellen Goldwasser. Thank you so much for being with us this evening. I'm a social worker and I'm the clinical supervisor for the Sacramento ARC office. The Anti-Recidivism Coalition works to end mass incarceration across the state of California. And ARC empowers formerly and, inc and currently incarcerated people um, to thrive by providing a support network, comprehensive reentry services, and avenues for advocacy with the long-term goal of transforming the criminal justice system so that it is a more just and equitable for everyone. Thank you again for um, being with us this evening. Thank you, Ellen. Next, let's move on to Dr. Jeff. Hey folks, Thank, thanks Devon Tate for that introduction and ARC for hosting and providing space for this really important discussion. My name is Jeff Reynoso. I'm the executive director for the Latino Coalition for Healthy California. We're a statewide policy advocacy organization advancing health equity for state's Latinx community. Uh, my background, I'm a son of immigrant, uh, grew up in the Central Valley and, and San Diego County, um, now currently based here in Sacramento. Um, I'm a public health practitioner by training and uh, my passion has always been health equity work. And uh, I've done a lot of work uh, at the intersection of healthcare and the criminal justice system. Thanks a lot for the, for the 
for the opportunity and looking forward to the conversation. Glad to have you here, Dr. Jeff. Thank you, sir. Next, Dr. Flo, let's go to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Flo Jean Kofer. I am an epidemiologist and I am the Senior Director of Policy for Public Health Advocates. And we are a statewide nonprofit that works on addressing public health issues, um, really thinking through sort of what does it mean to be healthy um, beyond just healthcare. And so I, get, I have a chance to partner with a lot of the people who are um, on the panel with me tonight. So it's a true honor to be here and just really glad to be thinking, especially in this time of COVID, especially in this time when our country is finally kind of wrestling with, you know, um, historic wrongs in a way that we should have done hundreds of years ago. Um, it is a real honor to be on this panel and to be illuminating some of these issues. So thank you for holding space for this. And um, thank you for, for putting this together to my brother's keeper. Thank you for being here. Looking forward to hearing everybody. Um, next, let's move on to Assembly Member McCarty. There we go. How are we doing, Devante? Thank you for the um, introduction, and I look forward to the conversation tonight. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Kevin McCarty, represent the 7th Assembly District. That's the Tower Bridge right behind me here in, in beautiful Sacramento, West Sac. Um, this is my sixth year in the State Assembly. Previously, I was on the Sacramento City Council for 10 years, so, you know, better part of a decade and a half working in public policy, trying to uh, fight for our communities, for, for justice, for marginalized and underrepresented communities. Um, and these issues are important to me. I'm a, a, a product of a, a biracial uh, family. I'm a proud member of the Black Caucus. And so I've always been pushing uh, righteous criminal justice reform, police reform. And uh, I've been trying and sometimes uh, swinging and missing. It's been hard the last few years pushing these things across the finish line. And we'll get into in a bit, but um, it seems that we have uh, a moment now where we can really push the envelope stronger than we've ever done before. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for joining us, Assembly Member McCarty. And last but not least, let's move on to Goia. Thank you so much, Devante. Hi, everyone. My name is Goia Yang, and I am with Mong Innovating Politics, also known as HIP. We are located in Sacramento and also Fresno, um, two of the most populated uh, cities in California with the, with the Hmong population. Um, and yeah, uh, HIP is a grassroots organization that is really focused on building the political power of Hmong and Southeast Asian communities, which has been historically disenfranchised communities um, here in the US. Um, and we do that by mobilizing our youth and families and really getting folks to be civically engaged. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I am from Del Paso Heights, grew up in Del Paso Heights. And, uh, you know, there's definitely a lot of things that I've learned uh, growing up um, in Del Paso Heights and wanting to ensure that I continue to fight for my communities and all of our communities. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to the discussion. We're glad to have you. Thank you for being here. Um, and now, now that we know, you know, who, who we have presenting tonight, um, it's, it's been an honor to be a part of this. Uh, when I seen the flyer, you know, I, I was like, I saw my picture and I'm like, that's, I'm like, that's dope. Like, go ahead, young brother, mm -hmm. you know? And then I seen the panelists and I was like, you know, like, this is gonna be, this is gonna be some real talk. So, um, like I said, I'm honored to be here. Um, just briefly, if it's okay with everyone, I would like to just give the, the audience just a, a better understanding about myself. Um, so I briefly int uh, introduced me and uh, you know where I'm, where I'm from and what I do now. But I'm 24 years old and four years ago, I would never thought I'd be you know moderating this discussion. And I say that because Four years ago, 2016, I was in a lot of pain. Um, you know, I I was I was born in Fort Worth, Texas. Let me start there. I moved I moved to Sacramento in 07 with my mom and my two sisters. Now, when I first got to Sac, it started off like I was back and forth in juvenile hall. I was in and out up until about the age of 18, right? So 
when I was in juvenile hall, I had my 18th birthday and I got my GED while I was inside of there. Turned 18, I got out. I enrolled in Sac City College. I got me a job. And for a cool minute, I was on a good path, the path that I was supposed to be on. I was doing good. I was staying out of trouble. Um, and then in 2016, um, right around the time when both of my kids were being born, um, I lost my mom, my rock, my everything. So that took a toll on me and I went right back to the streets, went right back to the drugs, right back to everything that I already do. And it ultimately led me, um, you know, catching my first case as an adult that same year, a couple months after that, you know, I caught my first case. I was released on bail and I went right back to the streets, like literally got out on bail, went right back to the streets. And um, I started rapping with my cousin. And a couple months later, I caught another case while being on, you know, already on bail. I caught another case, except this time I was facing some serious time. And so this is how I come from sitting in a jail cell to sitting behind this computer room, uh, moderating this discussion. When I was locked up, uh, I did, I had a basically long story short, I made a commitment with the higher power. And the commitment that I made with the higher power was a personal one. I said that if you get me through this, I will change the way I treat people. I will change the way, you know, I live my life and I'll continue to educate myself. I will continue to educate myself. I won't stop. And, you know, like miraculously, I was delivered out of that situation. And so when I got out, it was, it was really hard to keep my commitment. Like, you know, I try, I try really hard. And I was, it was a point like I was on a tipping point. You feel me? I was on this tipping point of where I could have went either way. And right when I was on that tipping point, before I could tip over, I was connected with a fellowship right here in Sacramento called My Brother's Keeper. And literally a year from my release date, I became a mentor in that program. And then I was shaking hands with President Barack Obama. And then it ultimately led me to here. And I say that, I tell you guys that story only because at the end of the day, if I tell my story, you're going to do what you want to with it. You're going to think what you want to think about me. But I tell that story because that story saved my life, right? I want to, I'm going to continue telling that story because I want to save another life along the way. And not only do I want to tell that story to save a life, but I'm still directly impacted with the issues that we face today about some of the topics that we about to be discussing tonight. So that's the reason why I want to give you guys uh, a background about me. Unfortunately, I just lost the past month. I just lost three people. One of them was my cousin that I told you guys about in the story where I started rapping. My cousin Briss, he was from Sacramento. I just lost him last month on Father's Day. So I've been dealing with that and it made me even more motivated to get on this uh, moderation and listen to what the panel have to say. So without further ado, um, I wanna go into our first discussion topic, which is this movement that we're in right now. Um, so I wanna first direct this question to Brother Kariga. So right now we're in some interesting times. There's this global movement that has started. And if it's safe to say it sparked after the death of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor. Brother Kariga, what would you say is different from this movement today that's different from previous movements that we've seen in the past? Devante, thank you so much for your your presence and moderation. Uh, thank you for your, your testimony. Um, I'd like to invite myself, if it's okay, and perhaps invite you all as well, to take a deep breath. I think that this conversation is set up so beautifully to move us through different experiences, <clears throat> different thinking, maybe different outcomes. But what I heard and what I just experienced is grief, Devante. And I wanna take a second to acknowledge that, that we don't have to process linearly past that 
that part of your story you're actively living, you're actively holding. Um, and it's incredibly dynamic and courageous of you. And from where you draw your strength to be present here in the moderation, you express that <clears throat> your moderating is an honor considering where you're coming from and your cousin Briss uh, and his legacy makes you want to stand in yours. So I just want to also acknowledge him and the impact he had on young folks in the city far and wide. And you asked me an interesting question, Devante. You asked me what makes this particular uh, social climate, this uprising, what makes it a little different? I would dare to say grief. I think there's a collective grief, a massive grief unfolding, unlike any other time before. And it's reorienting the way we see the world, the way we see one another. Uh, much of the racial conflict is not a matter of fact. Most of it is a matter of feel. The theories that frame white supremacies are not fact. They're not fact. They, they, they modified data, which any social scientist can do to prove a point. But the point was never real, which means that the racial construct and the theory thereof that which divides us isn't real. It is real, it has real outcomes, but it, racism isn't based on something true. So I think grief in this case is touching different parts of humanity. I think the massive grief caused by COVID-19, uh, the massive separation of connection and human interaction, the public outcry, the manner in which uh, these people were executed, the manner in which their humanity bled. Uh, I think that we're looking at a new configuration of how we see the world, how we see one another. And this grief is gonna, it's a reckoning point. It's a place for all of us to come together and reconfigure how much love can we carry across the finish line. We have to take inventory of our hearts and make more room for love, make more room for compassion. And you know, it happens in spaces where we make more room for learning. Thank you. Thank you for that response. I wanted to also um, hear the assembly member McCarty. I want to hear you chime in a little bit on this question as well. Yeah, I, I think um, we all see the movement is different. And uh, you know, we've, we saw the protests after Trayvon Martin, after Eric Gardner, after Stephon Clark here. And, you know, I thought it would spark an interest to, to push the envelope further. And it did marginally. You know, we had a big bill last year on police uh, reform, 392. It was helpful, but not a lot of the stuff we see now. And, but I'll just give you a real life example. Uh, we have this affirmative action bill that on the assembly in March, we, were, we needed to get 54 votes and we had about 30 solid yeses. We were 25 short. And we, we weren't looking like we were gonna win this year. And we needed to hustle, we needed to get on the ballot. And then all of a sudden, two months later, after George Floyd, frankly, we got to 60 votes. We had two Republicans vote for it. And uh, this moment and movement not only moved the people of America and moved politicians to go in that direction as well, because they are representative of a community and their community is saying, you know what, we need some bold action now. Uh, I had a big bill on voting rights for people in the justice system, which ARC helped me get across the finish line, free the vote for those formerly incarcerated. I, I, I didn't have my two thirds vote in the Senate and I, had, I was stuck at like 24 votes. And I had a Senator that was a solid no. I'm not gonna say um, their name right now, but they called me up after George Floyd and they said, look, I've been reevaluating what my internal definition of justice is and justice goes both ways. And because of my soul searching and where we're at today, I'm changing my vote. And literally I got goosebumps that Saturday because that broke open the floodgates and that was allowed me to get the votes to go to the floor to put in the ballots. Now we have Prop 17 on the ballots gonna restore voting rights for 50,000 Californians and get rid of these uh, you know, this old relic Jim Crow laws which disenfranchise primarily black and brown voters. And so I I've seen it firsthand that this, this, this movement and this moment is pushing lawmakers to press that button on more progressive issues than they had before in the past, but we shouldn't be done. We, we should think of this era as like, what else can we do? Because we know there is so much more to do 
to unring the bell of you know, his, 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 uh, systemic oppression and racial injustice in our, in our community and our state. So we're, on, we're only beginning. So what would you say the current pandemic and the whole COVID-19 thing, what do you say it has, what impact would you say it has on this current movement, this current justice movement? Um, the justice movement, I think, is more on the George Floyd um, era. But I think what COVID shows is that, is that poor people, brown and black people, are just behind. They're the ones who are more likely to get COVID, to get sick, to, get, to, to end up dying, to end up in the hospital, to end up losing their house because of mortgage and rent payments, to, to work in jobs where they can't take time off. And so it just reinforces what we've always thought. And, but now we see it in another lens through COVID-19. So I think that, you know, there's the governor talks about all the time. He talks about whatever we do should be in an equity lens. And so, you know, I think that we should use this to our advantage too, to talk about all policies we promote, whether they're, you know, housing policies, education, uh, resources on health, to look in an equity lens to see how this impacts communities like Black California that has been uh, systemically uh, held back for, for generations. Now, now you touched on policies and uh, I wanna say thank you for that response. You touched on policies and you know, things that um, are need and um, need, uh, need to be put in place. Um, so I wanna kind of have a, ask a follow-up question to that. Um, since you know, the protests and the murder of George Floyd and there, there have been things put into place, um, could you explain to us some of those things well, maybe you don't have to go deep into detail about the things that have been put in place, but kind of tell us um, where, since the protests have sparked and the killing has happened, where, what have we, what progress have we made and kind of how far, you know, do we yeah. still have to go? Great question. Um, you know, just in the last two weeks, we, we put these measures on the ballot, uh, voting rights and, um, uh, affirmative action, bringing it back to California that are going to be on the ballots, not just me. People here on this, on, this, on this Zoom can vote in November. But we have bills that are moving through the process that we're going to be finalizing in the next month or so on police reform. One's uh, you know, getting rid of the, the chokehold. We have another bill about decertifying road cops, cops who get fired from one big city and go to the next one and the little city didn't even know what they did the last city. So why are these people getting hired over and over if you're a teacher and do work at a nail salon, you mess up, you lose your license. Um, I, I have a bill on independent investigations for deadly force, which I could barely get a vote on in years past. And the times change. Now I have some law enforcement even saying, you know what, it's time for this change as well. So we have a lot of these, um, you know, police reform, reform bills going through the process. But we also have things that we're looking at in the entire lens of kind of their, their you know, the equity and racial justice lens. For example, ethnic studies. We talk about all the hate and division in our country. If you had ethnic studies requirements in high school and in college, you know, brown and black students would feel more reflective and comfortable about who they are, but also we'd be educating, you know, the rest of people in California to have better understanding of the issues, better understanding of the systemic issues. And, you know, some kids in our school say, why does you know, slavery 400 years ago impact us today. Well, you know, it does, you know, maybe 401 year, one year since that first slave ship arrived at Jamestown, but the impacts are still here today, which is why we're pushing a reparations bill this year to really understand that these impacts are still alive and well. So we're pushing a bold agenda and uh, I'm proud that a lot of people on this call are part of it. And this is a movement to really make it happen in this, in this era right now. Okay. Thank you, Assemblymember McCarty. Um, also, Dr. Flo, I wonder if you can, um, you know, chime in a little bit also about what things do you think still need to be done? I'm having trouble with my with my volume. Um, so you know, I think the the question about you know are there are there ways in which um, 
you know, we can sort of weigh in, I think is an important one, right? Um, and I think this moment, as many people have talked about, we've come to that for many different reasons, right? One of the reasons that we're in this moment is um, because we are in COVID and I'm an epidemiologist, so we have to bring that up, right? Um, and the idea that people are at home and therefore people are, you know, able to pay more attention um, and also that people are stressed out, right? And so then we're having this moment of reckoning because all those things are happening at the same time. Um, and that, that can't be understated. Um, I think, you know, the changing of hearts and minds is certainly happening in part because people are, are actually having to see things that have, you know, happened in the past, um, but, but maybe they were able to justify them away. Um, and I think, you know, we're going to talk a little bit later about why certain, you know, people um, have gotten more, more empathy from um, public empathy and public sympathy than others. Um, and I think it has a lot to do um, with that. We are often visual people. We, we, you know, we are socialized in certain ways. Um, and so when we really think about, you know, sort of the, the necessary um, ways of being able to build an, a movement, part of it is having people actually be able to see and remove all doubt of what might have been happening um, leading up to the moment, you know, where, where things are occurring um, and allowing them to really be able to, to wrestle with the injustice of it. Um, I'm reminded of during the civil rights movement that it wasn't until people saw people on TV being hosed down um, and be, having dogs sicked on them that the movement began to turn tide. Before that, you know, people felt the same way about um, Doc, Dr. King and other folks in SNCC and, you know, um, and the NAACP that people feel about Black Lives Matter right now, right? And, and the folks who are out protesting now. So there certainly is, is sort of a correlation in terms of how these movements build. Um, and I think, I think part of what we're seeing right now is the culmination of a lot of research and a lot of data that's come to bear. And then a lot of people really being able to take advantage of a moment where people are frustrated and where our current systems are, have failed them. Because these systems are operating exactly the way that they're designed to work, the challenge is they were designed to be inequitable. And so therefore the outcomes are inequitable. Um, and I think that's probably one of the biggest things that we're noticing um, and that sort of brings us to this movement and, um, and certainly the, the threat of, you know, power concedes nothing without demand. And so that demand has to be there, that demand has to loom large and that demand has to come in a lot of different forces. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you know, when, pe when peaceful protest runs out, people will, you know, begin to, to engage in non-peaceful protests. But um, I would argue that the acts of violence that our society commits on people are even greater in terms of um, the ways in which people are harmed than property damage, which is largely the way that people respond um, to be able to share. And I would say that thoughtful leaders, um, including the one we happen to have um, on our panel tonight, would, would, you know, turn to those and say, what am I missing? What do I need to hear, right? Um, you know, what, what is the message that's coming to me from them? Great, right. you you actually lead me into my my next topic that I wanted to discuss, and that is historically and also now there have been different viewpoints about the best and the most effective way to advocate for change. Um, some say you know protest is not going to do it. Protest is not going to solve it all. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask the question of what do you think are some of the necessary building blocks for effective change in a, in a very effective movement. And we can, uh, Dr. Flo, if you wanted to go ahead and finish your thought up with this question, and then after you, we can open it up to the rest of the panelists. Yeah, I mean, I think part of what, what we consider to be the building blocks of an effective movement are um, a broad coalition. So you want to have people, you don't you can't have people burn out. Um, you want to have people who are really committed to the movement and bring lots of diverse strengths. Um, so that's that's one of the things that's a building block. Another one is you know being able to make a sound argument um, that that people who are in power, um, that people who um, have the ability to create change, are able to hear and to receive and to be able to create action on. Um, so one thing that's always really important is to have a vision for what you want to see, not just a vision for what you don't want to see. Um, so there's something to fill in the blanks. Um, I think another thing you know that that happens is um, is that there's usually some inflection 
point that has occurred that really allows people to take hold of um, what's happening. Uh, maybe it's a broader coalition of people being affected. Maybe it's people seeing something that's particularly egregious that allows them to be able to see how deep seated issues are. Um, but typically that's sort of the way that these things kind of come together. Um, and it allows us then to be able to really clearly um, sort of see what's happening in a movement and be able to move it forward. But certainly the people, the people are the power behind what's happening always. And so when the people come together and they really mobilize, it's really hard. It's easy to quiet individual people, but it's really hard to quiet a movement of people um, who when, when some take the day off, there are other ones to just replenish them. It's really hard to quiet people who come from different perspectives so that you can't sideline it and say, oh, well, it's only the black people or, oh, well, it's only the women. Oh, well, it's only the, when people come together and really shout together, there is a power in that. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, the clenched fist is, is the power is, you know, the symbol of so many movements because individually those fingers are doing their own thing, but together this is much more powerful than this. Um, and so when we come together, that's that's really what undergirds a lot of these movements is people really agreeing to collaborate and to articulate a shared vision um, and not, not and a vision that's different from what they're seeing right now. Thank you. Uh, Brother Kariga, do you have any thoughts on that question as well? Yeah, I think one, Dr. Flo, thank you for um, creating so many pathways to think about that question. Um, uh, you name so many that I find valid. Uh, but of course, we know the powers in the people. But I would also say the um, in narrative owning uh, and actually storytelling and owning your story and telling your story. So that would come in the form of media. Um, there has been a particular ability to engage uh, audiences and different demographics with who controls the story, who controls the media. Um, and we know that art is a large contribution to the narrative of storytelling. Um, you talk about music being embedded into a movement. Uh, you're talking about who's controlling the story. You're talking about carrying on the spirit. So I think the storytelling, the media control is a huge part. Um, goes without being said, but it, it, it often is taking away from people's access to their own storytelling because they're often framed before they get to tell their own story. Thank you, thank you. Um, so with that being said, there has been a lot of, you know, uproar from the people in the community about police reform. Um, especially the community I live in, you hear it all the time, you know, you hear, um, you know, defund the police and and all these different um, ways that folks think um, if you somehow, you know, see change, uh, we, we have to start with, you know, the people that are enforcing rules and enforcing laws. And um, I want to kind of hear from Ellen, um, what is your response to people who bring up the black on black crime um, in a response to police violence? Sure, thank you for that question, Devante. And I think that, you know, the majority of the time when people are bringing up black on black crime, it's to deflect attention away from police brutality. And so to try to um, say that one, by, by deflecting attention from one issue that makes another issue acceptable is, um, is inappropriate, but also, you know, facts are facts and, and African-Americans are two and a half times more likely than whites to be killed by law enforcement. And um, of people who have been killed by the police, 28% are black, despite only being 13% of the population. So I also think that, you know, while, while that fact may be true, it's not only deflecting from, you know, the importance of holding police and criminal justice systems accountable, but it's also, you know, when you flip the script, you don't hear a lot of what about white on white crime, but the fact is, you know, people generally commit crimes against people that they know or that they live near. And we live in typically very segregated communities. So it's also more common for white people to be called by, killed by white people. And so I think if we want to really have a, a discussion about crime, we have to talk about the factors that contribute 
to crime, which is that we live in a country where the poverty rate is twice as high among African Americans than white people. And that has a whole lot to do with 400 years of systemic racism more than anything else, which we see continued in the criminal justice system today as well. Thank you. I would also like to hear doc from Dr. Flo on this question as well. Sure, and I think I have just some um, some visuals if we can put those up because I, I think this is a I think Ellen made first of all some really really great points about you know how this term is only used when most crime is interracial, um, but I want to just remind us that the root causes of violence are known. They have been known for a while. They have been studied, and there are essentially three um, that can certainly be parsed out into others. But the big things are generational trauma, systemic poverty, and institutional neglect. And when you have those anywhere on the planet, you will see a higher rate of violence, period. So that is not unique to Black people. That is not unique to, um, to people who, um, you know, because of some sort of inherent deficit in people. It's because those are the drivers of crime. Um, and so when we think about, you know, the ways in which we should be investing in things, we should be investing in things that address systemic poverty and, you know, generational trauma and institutional neglect. And so that means that if we're talking about safety, we need to be investing in the things that make us safe from the preventive side. Um, and so, you know, in most cities, you know, somewhere between 45 and 65% of a city's budget is spent on policing. Um, and even if you think your police department is doing a really great job, guess what? Their job is not to prevent crime. It is to respond to it. And so if you spend all of your money on response, you don't actually get the thing that you want in the first place, which is safety. I like to tell people all the time, for me, justice is not solving my murder. It's not doing something with my murderer. Justice for me is never being murdered in the first place. And so if I were to if sit down with a doctor at age 20 and say to them, you know, gosh, what can I do to be healthy? And they say, oh, don't worry about it. We have this really great bypass surgery that we'll give you in 25 years. It'll be awesome. You'll, you'll be back on your feet in no time. I'd stop and say, hold on a second. Is there something I can do to prevent having bypass surgery? And if we don't start talking about nutrition and physical activity and my level of stress and the air I breathe and the water I drink and all these other things that are preventive in nature, then we have missed the mark. And that would be an ineffective healthcare provider to not say to me, here are all the ways that we can prevent this. And here are all the ways that we're going to support you in preventing. And so it's really important that when we talk about violence, that we're really clear that violence is preventable. It has known patterns. Um, we, you know, all the people who do domestic violence said, as soon as we started shelter in place, and as soon as you started closing down businesses and laying folks off, domestic violence is going to go up because that is a recipe for what happens. Um, and so we understand this. And the challenge, though, is that when it comes to actually how we spend our money, we act like we don't know. We throw our hands up and say, we just need more police. That's, that's what we do. Um, and it's simply not true. And the best example of that is the other emergency response folks, the fire department. Only 2% of, of the calls the fire department receives are for fires. Why? Because we shored up our electricity systems, because we made sure that we have good uh, appliances that don't catch on fire and burn our houses down, because we build with better materials. So that is what we do. We invested in prevention and boom, we don't have as many fires as we did 100 years ago. So the same thing is true here with violence. We just have not used the political will to invest in the things that we know can make sure that we prevent it. And that really is the challenge. Amen. Amen. Um, now, I would I wanted to take this time to see if any of the other other panelists would like to respond to this question. And if you need me to repeat the question, it's all good. I'll repeat it one more time. The topic of police reform has been a huge, huge um, discussion. What is your response to people who bring up um, black on black crime in uh, response to uh, police violence? Well, Devante, I'll just be really quick here. Um, honestly, that hasn't came up. I know that you see, you know, conservatives on Fox News and the president of the United States. I don't like to say his name, but we know who he is talking about this nonsense. But as Flo said, it's a total distraction. Um, it doesn't come up, you know, people, people know it now they see it with their own two eyes. I, I've, I've been saying this and it's so simple, but it's hard to really understand, especially for younger people. You know, when I was in my twenties, when I was maybe your age, Devante, a young man, I saw this footage of Rodney King getting beaten on the freeway 
And it was crazy. Some guy had his camcorder and we, we didn't have camcorders. I mean, you had to be rich to have one of those. Some guy had it in the back of his car. He grabbed it out. He took, the, took this footage and it was as Flo said, you know, you saw the hoses in Birmingham for the first time. And so I was like, wow, that was, that's maybe rare. That doesn't usually, shouldn't happen. That was a one-off. And there was this big trial and the police were acquitted and so forth. Now in the last 10 years, you see it with your own two eyes, not personally, but you see it on your computer screen or phone with the, the dash cams, cell phones, like with George Floyd, the, the body cams, what have you. And so the people in our community across the nation have said, you know what, enough. We, we, this is too much. And we've seen it that, that the response is disproportionate and the response is, 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 is way worse for, for black communities than others. And so we don't even, I don't even hear that question. It's, it's a total distraction. Thank you much. Devontae, I wanted to speak to that question. I almost, because the answers were so thorough, Ellen, um, wonderful points, Dr. Flo, uh, Assemblyman, like I, I really, I saw the, the, the breadth of it, but I thought about a conversation that I've been having to be careful with and maybe stay away from. Um, and that conversation, that's beautiful. That's beautiful, by the way. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, I was in a conversation, in a, it's conversation when I see persons from lived black experiences pose that. Um, that has probably been one of my deeper um, triggers in this time of reckoning with racial uh, composition and reconciliation. So when I see persons who live the black experience ask that question, I acknowledge that they are so close to a harm that makes it far too difficult to see past that point. So we, we live in this national conversation, but meanwhile, somebody don't got time for this national conversation. Somebody who's close to the trauma and the, and the hurt has no time to subscribe to this conversation as we unpack this. So we also have to recognize that as we talk about the margins, the margins are actually occurring. And it's been my work of empathy to have respect for those questions because those questions are being proposed when they are too close to an immediate hurt. The violence in our community is unreal. Um, the annual traumas we experience are unreal. The anniversary dates of one family member passing and another community member passing, it makes the national conversation hard to participate in, which then makes it harder to mobilize the black voice because we have to get far better. When Dr. Flo says we know what's creating the crime, we have to get far better at impacting those social predictors so we can get more engagement, so we can get more of a clenched fist, right? We can have as many logos and as many emblems of unity marches and, and, and social organizations that have a fist representation, but we know truly this fist is not clenched yet because we don't engage the margins. That's why I'm so glad Devante is here to be able to stand at the intersection of his lived experiences and his peers and this conversation and begin to mold something that looks more inclusive because the gun violence and the way gun violence interrupts your ability to process anything else because of offense is so immense that we're not actually engaging the population in the type of conversation and solution that we want to. So I just wanted to lift as a point that I have experienced trigger. I've had experience disabling my, I've had to go to my wife and be like, hey, stop me from calling them. Please take my phone. Like I'm ready to call people out of accountability. Because the question for me is so perplexing to think that you can miss it, but I also have to recognize that you are a human being living with grief. You're not a, you may have had privilege to some of the learn, same learning spaces that some of us may have had access to. You may not get the nuances of race and, rep and, and racial composition. And, and the fact that when I say things like, we have to fight this fight and it's not even true. I just wanna name that, that the consequences of racism, the consequences of their false philosophy and their terrible statistics, the consequences are real, but the premise is false and we're still fighting it. And we have to, we have, to have social, social scientists train in measures to refute false evidence. We have people who have dedicated careers to that, just to refuting false evidence in which the racial composition was arrived at. So I just wanted to lift that 
that question isn't only coming from the other side. Sometimes it's coming from our wounds right within our community. And that's a hard one to address. Yes, yes, real talk, real talk. And um, I, wanna, I wanna circle back to that because earlier before we started, um, I shared a little bit about my story. And I wanted to, to just say that that story is the story of countless <laughs> boys, right? And a lot of times they stories go unheard or, you know, something like that. And in the midst of this movement, one of the most important demographic stories also get lost, and that is women. Women are oftentimes on the front line of these conversations, these debates, these movements, period. You know, when we're talking about even advocating for men, our women are right there on the front line. And um, even when we're, you know, we speak about all the women right now, Sandra Bland, even Breonna Taylor, you know, it's been four months since she was murdered, you know, shot eight times in her own home and the officers are still walking around. So when it comes to the women, I want to ask the question, how can we be more intentional about protecting our women when it comes to these injustices um, when it comes to advocating for change, how can we make sure that our women are not only at the forefront, but they're also, you know, receiving resources and stuff to help further that demographic? I want to direct this question to Dr. Flo. Sure. So um, first and foremost, I, I really think I appreciate this question being here because so often we lump you know, what's happening together. And we just talk about people who've been killed and we don't call women out directly. And I think it's incredibly important that we do. Um, and the part of the reason and we talked, you know, before about the images, right? Well, you know, what has happened is that many of the men who have been killed have been killed in very public ways. Um, and we've seen, we've been able to see it on camera. We've been able to see Philando Castile. We've been able to see Eric Garner. We've been able to see George Floyd, right? We have seen these videos um, of people being killed. Whereas women um, who have been killed by police have been killed in ways that were not videotaped. You know, we have, um, as you know, children as young as four being shot while sleeping because there was a no-knock raid that was done, um, you know, in a, in a place. And so there was obviously no video camera of that. Um, Breonna Taylor is another one who was shot while she was sleeping. So again, there's no video of that. And so I think part of what, is hap what has happened is that um, there are all of these questions around, well, what happened? Well, you know, well, well, what were the circumstances? Well, why this and why that? Um, and even Sandra Bland, we have the video of her being arrested under really sh shady, you know, pretenses, but we don't know what happened thereafter. We don't have a video to be able to show. So I think that is part of the disparity, um, is just the way in which um, women have, have largely been the victims of this violence. I think the other thing though, is that we haven't done a good job of addressing violence against women globally, period. Um, we have not done a good job of, of um, having conversations um, about domestic violence, period. So when it comes to, um, you know, women that, you know, growing up, I remember being told, if you're ever being abused, don't yell rape, don't yell, you know, help me, yell fire. The fact that we tell people that no one cares if you're being sexually assaulted, but people will care about fire, says all you need to know about the level of misogyny, or in the case of Black women, misogynoir, which was a term coined specifically around, you know, disregard and, and disdain for Black women, that speaks to that, right? The idea that we wouldn't even, we, we don't care. Um, and so I, I think we need to be really intentional about saying the names. I mean, that's where the, the phrase at protests say her name came from, is because there are so many many women who have been killed who have not gotten the level of attention that they deserve. Um, and I think we need to really be, be mindful of the ways in which the existing um, ways that violence plays out against women. Um, we even are seeing this now with Megan Thee Stallion where people were literally arguing that this woman deserved to be shot because she was taller than the man who shot her. 
I mean, that speaks to a level of disregard that we can't overlook. Um, and so, so that really is what stands out to me is that this is what we're having here is we're seeing a symptom of the broader disdain that we see for, for women and in particular Black women um, in society. And a lot of it has to do with the racism and the way in which Black women have sort of been seen as um, not needing to be protected um, and, um, and, and have, have also been sort of framed very stereotypically as being the aggressors and therefore, um, and therefore more deserving of the ire. And we even see that happening with our babies in school. Like black girl, we talk about boys all the time, but black girls are eight times as likely to be suspended from school as white girls. Um, and so we really need to talk about just generally speaking how the intersections of racism and sexism come together and impact um, Black girls in particular. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Flo. Now, fellas, y'all gonna get y'alls. This question is strictly for the ladies, all right? So first I want to uh, let uh, Ellen, if you have anything to speak on this question, we're gonna go to you first. And then I wanna hear from Ms. Uh, Goia. I definitely echo um, the sentiments of what Flo mentioned. I think that there's an expectation in our country, in our society, and in the world that women will be strong, that will, women will be supporters, and that um, there is a uh, the expectation that women will um, be resilient. And I think that we need to um, refocus that and listen to what women have to say. And as you mentioned at the beginning, really uplift their stories, um, say the names of the women who are being um, murdered by the police and um, listen to what they have to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, Dr. Flo, you are always so thorough and I am always so impressed by your responses. Um, you know, I do just want to reemphasize what Dr. Flo has already said is that we live in a very violent world. We live in a very violent country. Um, and so, you know, to me, I feel like patriarchy has not been addressed. We have not shined the light on it um, enough. And maybe it's also falling too much on deaf ears. Right. Um, and so um, I, I also feel like we do need to really be able to figure out how we can start addressing what's happening systematically, but also what's happening at the homes and they are interconnected. Um, I know that right now, you know, if you've been following SAC B and all that, there has been a, a conversation around Hmong patriarchy as well. Um, and, you know, I appreciate uh, Kariga's point around taking control over um, the narrative, right? So right now, you know, the mainstream nar narrative has been painting only as if like the Hmong people are the only ones that have an issue of patriarchy. But the reality is that we live in a white supremacist country that, you know, um, also emasculates our men, our men of color. Um, and so that also perpetuates the patriarchy and sexism that we face um, within our own communities. And so I think, you know, as much as we're, we're standing up for um, social justice, we also have to ensure that we are including um, the voices of our women and not just that, but also the voices of our queer communities as well um, and really lifting them up um, in these conversations. Great, great point. Now, Goia, while I have you right here, you, you bring up you know, being inclusive and including and um, you know, controlling the narrative. When we when we talk about um, non-black allies, how can our non-black allies also offer the support to the black community um, during these times? And how can they also continue to uplift their stories and include themselves? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. I mean, I would say, you know, the most simplest answer is to turn to curiosity. Um, I think too often, you know, when we hear Black Lives Matter, that non-Black folks start to feel triggered for whatever reason, right? And I've been kind of reflecting on, you know, why is that happening in my mom community, you know? Um, and, I, and I think about what Kariga mentioned earlier is this, this whole concept of grief, right? So even for the Hmong community, you know, we come to the U.S. as refugees. Um, and so that means that we, we fled war-torn countries, right? 
we left a very violent country to come into another violent country. Um, and also our Hmong community and Southeast Asian community, our population is small compared to, you know, everybody else in the country. And oftentimes like our stories are not shown because we don't, you know, quote unquote, have enough numbers to, you know, show folks that, you know, we also have issues. And I think that's why there's something like the census that we care so much about because it's like the only national body of data that disaggregates our uh, Hmong data, right? So my thing is, you know, turn to curiosity, ask those questions, you know, um, have a genuine conversation with a black person, with your black neighbors, with your black colleagues, um, and really, you know, seek for understanding and to learn, right? And um, I think, you know, more often than not, we will see that there's a lot of commonalities. You know, there is the intergenerational trauma um, that we face in our Southeast Asian communities. And I know Dr. Flo mentioned a little bit about ge generational trauma as well. There's so many parallels, right? And that, you know, in our conversations, we would be able to hear what are the disparities? You know, for me being an Asian American woman or a Hmong American woman, I, I know that I don't necessarily always have to, you know, think about how you, if my brothers were to um, to leave the house, what's going to happen to them? But I think about, you know, the Black sisters in my life who share those concerns about their kids. And I'm like, damn, like those are hella real. And those are issues that I don't have to constantly worry about, right? So those are when, you know, things are not the same. And it makes me have a deeper understanding of, of where we need to show up for, you know, our Black uh, sisters and brothers. The other thing in terms of curiosity is, you know, uh, go to a city council meeting. Right now we're, we're you know, in COVID-19 and everything is virtual. If we have better access, you know, tune into a city council meeting, tune into a school board meeting. I bet you most often than not, you will see that sometimes decision makers are not making decisions in your best interest. And when I say you, I'm talking about my Hmong community, my Southeast Asian community, right? And so that's why to me, um, I feel like it's so important for us to be fighting alongside, you know, our Black community because um, we, our liberation are really connected. Um, it's tied together. We have similar struggles. And, um, you know, we, when we fight together, it's like what Dr. Flo already said is that it's really about the solidarity and like, you know, the people power um, that will really create change because, the truth is for me, like being one of the rare Hmong advocates out there, um, there's a lot of people that don't know what is going on in our community. You know, when I say we need disaggregated data, they're like, I don't know what that means. You know, when I say we need data to show that Hmong folks are also um, impacted, um, they don't know what that means. And they, you know, if they do know what it means, their response will be, that's going to cost us too much money. So again, it's comparing numbers to people's lives. And I think, you know, it's about time, you know, our communities really step up to the plate um, and, you know, stop being afraid, you know, and just say what's up to your neighbors, you know, try to get into a genuine conversation. And so, I mean, I, I know I'm keeping it simple, but I think that is the first step to really being able to show up. Um, and, you know, the more you get to, dive into these conversations and learn, the more that you will learn what it means to show up, right? Um, show up for yourselves. And part of showing up for ourselves is showing up for the Black community. Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know um, Ellen is really tapped in with, these, with, this, with this topic as well. So if, if you guys wouldn't mind, I would love to hear Ellen's uh, viewpoint on this question as well. Sure. And Devante, just to repeat the question, are you asking about um, how non-Black allies can support the Black community? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really echo a lot of things that Goia said. I think those are really important points. Um, I also think about the late, great John Lewis in when you see something that isn't fair or just, you have to say something. And it's that's not to simplify things, but that's making, you know, this issue about everyone, it's personalizing it, it's making it 
um, relevant to all of us. And so I think that oftentimes we talk about standing for something and we as white allies need to not stand you know, for black people, for marginalized populations, but stand with them, listen to what, what marginalized people, what black people, what people of color have to say and how to follow their lead in the movement. Um, I also think about a lot of, in this movement, there's been a lot of uh, social media posts, a lot of performance allyship. And so just thinking about how we continue this conversation beyond um, you know, the current time and how we not only consider what we're posting and what is the outcome of that post, is it really about the impact of the post? Is it about changing systemic issues? Um, and, and once the protests are over, are you going to continue? Are you gonna um, you know, continue that conversation and be heard loud and clear? And so again, voting for people whose work reflects justice and accountability to all people, um, donating to organizations who are doing the work, um, supporting black owned businesses. And if you're in charge of hiring at your organization or at your business, hiring, promoting, um, figuring out how to retain um, black folks and for mental health professionals. You know, we've talked a lot about grief. We've talked a lot about the, um, the systemic oppression of black people and how that impacts their mental health. And so having professionals who are not just culturally humble, but really, are asking the questions, are understanding, you know, the population that they're serving. And so having more therapists who look like the people who they're serving, and as well as educators, teachers, um, doctors, uh, medical professionals, and, you know, one day of diversity training isn't enough. We have to understand and acknowledge our country's history and ask questions. As Goia said, we need to get to know people who are different from us. We need to include them in our social circles. And when you hear family members, friends having conversations and you don't agree with those, challenging them in those conversations. And I think we're gonna post some um, resources afterwards as well, but um, definitely I can just mention a, a few organizations showing up for racial justice, the Anti-Racism Center, um, the Audre Lorde Project, of course, um, ARC, follow us on social media and the Equal Justice Initiative, um, really talk about criminal justice and reform as well as um, doing the anti-racism work. Thank you, thank you, Ellen. Um, I also wanted, I'm eager to hear what Dr. Jeff has to say about this question as well. Thanks, Devante. Uh, I echo a lot of the sentiments and actions that have already been shared. I think how our organization has been looking at it as primarily an immigrant rights serving organization is the acknowledgement just from the start. Uh, Latin America, we share the same history with the United States, a history of genocide of native peoples, a history of slavery against um, African peoples. And so for, for us as an organization, it was the start of a conversation that when we talk about um, immigrant rights, that includes African immigrants, right? And Afro-Latino immigrants. So our community um, is multiracial and an understanding that we need to uplift those indigenous and black voices and, and in all of these conversations and policy discussions um, and being in those leadership um, positions. So, you know, for, for us, it was um, an acknowledgement and actions of how we're going to respond uh, one aspect of that is um, kind of the narratives that we share. You know, I think I, I share the sentiment that so much of uh, a policy um, is so much driven by media and how we approach issues. And so it's so important to uplift stories. Um, we also uh, have been thinking about what allyship means um, with the current, current movement. Um, and if we're going to have um, an intersectional movement where we're building power together. It means showing up, right? Um, I mean, showing up for for uh, for criminal justice issues, um, and you know, I think that reciprocity of uh, of doing that um, in the in the shared understanding that 
um, our black sisters and brothers are going to show up for immigrant rights issues um, when we need support um, as a community. And so um, it, it's that. Um, it's also uh, for those of us that are in these leadership positions in the nonprofit sector, it's thinking about um, when there are opportunities to partner, are we partnering with black serving or black led organizations um, when funding opportunities come up and, and we're making those funding decisions, are we inviting um, those partners um, into the conversation, into the table? Um, and then, you know, I think for, um, you know, as private people that, you know, you know are, we still live in a capitalist society and um, we, we have to support businesses, right? Um, and so, thinking about how we can support um, black owned businesses, you know, we can definitely share. Um, I know you all are sharing resources after the webinar. Uh, there's so many lists out there of, of black owned businesses here in Sacramento and pretty much every city has to those lists now. Um, so thinking about as we're having the next conference, the next, you know, um, the next meeting event, convening, like, uh, are we are we also like supporting our local black owned businesses? So, you know, I think it's, it's a lot of like, simple, um, how um, Goya uh, mentioned earlier, it's a lot about those like everyday simple actions um, in terms of like how we show up in our, in our allyship. Um, but at the core for, for our organization is just, you know, being intersectional, um, uplifting those intersectional identities, um, because I think that's how we, you know, that's how we build a long-term movement um, and, and that's how we sustain the movement um, over time. Wow, that was heavy, Ben. I mean, you already answered the next question I was going to ask, but I do have a follow-up question to what you were saying. Um, so on the flip side, um, you're talking about, you know, coming together. But on the flip side, I want to ask you, do you, would you say that the, um, the non-Black people of color uh, community would you feel, would you say that they feel um, that they've been supported by the black community on um, injustices in their community? That's a, that's a great question. You know, I think, um, you know, I'll frame it this way. Like, I think there's those opportunities, right? Um, I think about this moment and where, where are those intersections of, of opportunity for, 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 for our, our communities, our movement, um, one of the um, issues that we've been raising um, during COVID-19, so we're seeing the disproportionate impact, right, on black and brown bodies um, here in California, in, in the United States. One of the issues um, that we've been following really closely has been the conditions of um, our communities that are in immigrant detention centers, so immigrant prisons. Uh, so we've been um, working with our local partners. Um, there's this prison um, in Southern California, in the Inland Empire, in, in uh, San Bernardino County called Adelanto. So they're, you know, one of those notorious prisons. Um, there have been reports um, from um, um, those who are detained there of just like the most unsanitary, like most inhumane practices, um, you know, folks just being sprayed with, uh, with um, disinfectant, um, chemical burns, um, just uh, respiratory issues. And I think uh, those conditions, really that racism and that xenophobia that drives the prison industrial complex also operates within ICE detention, right? So I think that's an opportunity for both of our movements to, to converge and, and support one another. Um, I know there, there was just an action um, a couple of days ago um, at the governor's house um, here in Sacramento, uh, really thinking through and uplifting, um, uh, you know, how do we release those prisoners? We've seen outbreaks, right, in the Bay Area um, uh, with, with prisons there. And so, you know, I think right now is a moment of opportunity, right? Um, as bad as COVID-19 is, I think it, it has, you know, all of these like intersecting issues have come to the forefront. And, you know, I think there's so many opportunities to, to support um, um, one another around these issues of, uh, in particular, criminal justice and the impacts on um, brown and black communities. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Jeff. And I just want um, Goia to go ahead and close out this question for us, please. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I would say, you know, we know this already, but I need to say it. Historically, we have benefited from black led movements. You know, I think without the black led movements in the past, we would not be able to have like these school meals or have equal rights or, 
you know, be able to vote or, you know, and so I would say if that's not support, I don't know <laughs> what is. Um, but I would say that, you know, there's definitely a lot of um, a lot of work that we have yet to do. Right. Um, and it's not just like from the, the community, but also um, in terms of the elected officials. And I'm glad that Assemblymember McCarty is here with us to be a part of this conversation, too but that we still have to fight for stuff like ethnic studies. And we can't do that alone, right? Like we need all of us to do it, uh, that we have to replace US history with ethnic studies. Um, and it's not just like, oh, this one semester requirement that we're fighting for, but ultimately that's my end goal. Um, I think, you know, we have to also really push for um, like the local region to really invest in our young people um, and, you know, ensure that we're providing robust like youth enrichment programs, youth jobs, you know, so that we're building a culture of young people who are growing up uh, knowing that they have a lot of love for themselves. Um, and that they, you know, because they're, they have a lot of love for themselves that they can love their neighbors, that they could love their classmates, right? Um, but I, I, but we're far from that, you know, we're, we're still in, you know, these heavy discussion about why is it that the city is not holding themselves accountable to ensuring that funds are going into the community, um, right? So I do feel like a lot of the work that our Hmong and Southeast Asian communities, you know, what we're ben benefiting from has really been off of the backs of, you know, um, our Black leadership. Um, so I do want to say, you know, in short, yes, you know, we do feel supported but we have a long way to go in order to really learn more about each other. Thank you, thank you so much. Um, yeah, that, that, that ended the question off perfectly. Thank you for giving us that perspective um, from, your, from your opinion in your community. Um, thank you. Um, so I see y'all been participating in this chat box, man, y'all. I like for surely, like I see Lyndon, Mr. Price, he been, he been going crazy in there. Um, we got we got we got a couple questions, and we want to make sure that we we give you uh, you guys some times to um, to you know get your voices heard and acknowledged. Um, so, hey, yeah. can, can, can I just, can I offer something really quickly? Yes, sir. Um, before we get into that, um, Dr. Jeff, I heard you talk about um, what's happening across the lines of the prison industrial complex and what's happening to um, our folks who represent the margins of um, the Latino community, the Latinx community, and what America really tries to do when they steal bodies, right? When they steal bodies and then when, they, and when they enslave people and when they put people under conditions that are inhumane. And I just wanna lift um, that I think that August would be a particularly powerful time for members of the black community and uh, supporting the black community to observe black August and what that represents for standing in solidarity with prison rights and standing in solidarity with the human beings that have been taken away for their families. I think it's a really powerful time to intersect um, our collective freedom. The prison industrial complex is a, is a very vicious cycle that, that separates families and creates the conditions for crime and poverty and harm. So I think it, it, it requires all of us to take a a, an examination point with that. Uh, and I just want to lift that because um, my heart breaks when I feel uh, disempowered, when I feel like I can't get to the families or the young people who have been put in cages or the mothers who have been put in cages or the families that have been separated, right? And enslaved in this way. Uh, so I'm just hoping that we can center our hearts, um, center our actions and center our prayers toward all those incarcerated. Uh, especially as we kind of recommit ourselves to taking care of ourselves and going forward in August. Um, I also just want to be very transparent about something and I'm going to do it in courage, um, not in like a, a, a silencing act. I am currently involved in a very intimate level of grief. Uh, my wife and I are angel parents. That means we experience the birth of our child and the double transition at birth. Um, she was born in September and I'm sharing this as context because uh, each time I have to engage with a date on my calendar, it creates this type of 
pressure to be present, but the unpredictability of what the future holds. Um, and today I had quite a bit of commitments um, via web. And I just wanted to speak um, that I'm going to have to practice being gentle with myself. Uh, I have to take care of myself now. I have to attend to uh, my home, the grief, uh, but hopefully I'm just um, not exiting with noise, but also just giving us all gentle reminders to check on ourselves, uh, be patient with ourselves as we meet these new commitments, as we try to reconfigure ways of building bridges across difference, that we also learn to listen to ourselves and listen to our bodies. So hopefully my practicing of that today uh, just comes as a welcome and a reminder to you all. Devante, uh, thank you so much for holding space. Thank you so much for showing up for yourself today and showing up for young people who have experiences similar to yours. Thank you for being present. To the whole panel, thank you. I thank you all so much. Take care. I thank you, man. This was all an honor, man. Thank you for sure. So um, we have a question from the chat box that I want to address really quick because it is it is a really, really important question that we have to ask. Um, so I want to I'm going to open it up for whichever panelist wants to uh, answer it. Um, but I want to just see what are you guys' suggestions on how can we all take care of ourselves? Self-care, what are your thoughts on self-care? Well, I'll, I can hop in. Um, I So I am a big <laughs> like proponent of self-care in part because um, as I, I mentioned briefly earlier, like, you know, we don't want to burn out. Um, and there's a lot of important work that's happening and a lot, and it's, it's very, you know, deep and heavy work. And I just want to honor, you know, what Karika was just saying in terms of, you know, I, you know, he, he and his wife have been going through this for months now. Um, and that that's happening underneath everything else that's, that's happening. That's real life as well. Um, and so part of it is that we need to be really intentional about making sure that we're attending to our, our basic needs, right. Our sleep, our, you know, our hydration, our food, um, the amount of time and love we have with one another. And we need to be honest about the fact that we're all trying to operate as if things are normal. And this has not been a normal time. Like human beings are, are you know, creatures of habit and all of our habits have been disrupted. Um, I'm a person who likes to, you know, spend time with friends. I will come over to your house and curl up in a ball, you know, and snuggle with you because I'm a physical touch person. I like getting massages as part of my way of taking care of myself. I can't do any of that, right? Um, I'm, I'm stuck at home. I'm an extrovert. So all of these things are happening to us and we need to be patient and kind with one another. We need to attend to ourselves more. And so one of the ways I've been doing that is um, spending more time outside um, and spending time in particular in my garden growing things and it's watching the change. But it also for me is very healing because it's connecting to something that was bastardized because of my history. You know, I'm one of the black Americans who was stolen um, from land and, um, and you brought here to cultivate land under force. Um, and so there is a disconnection that happens there and there's a way that that's tied with trauma. And I found it to be very healing to be able to go and to do that, to grow something, to put my hands in the soil, to be away from a screen, all of those things. And so I think we all need to just focus on finding those things that that remind us who we are, that connect us with our humanity, and that allow us to rest, um, and really being intentional about doing that. Because you can't pour from an empty well, and I'm a chemist by training, and so I always tell people that our work, this social justice work, is like a gas. It will take up whatever space we give it, and it is our job to put the constraints on it, to say this is where the gas will be, and this, these are the, the boundaries that I'm setting, and we all need to be really intentional about setting healthy boundaries. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that closing thought. Um, so I wanted to throw in my own closing thought as well, um, based off of what you just said. Um, so as we, you know, come to the end of this panel, um, I've, you know, I've gotten a chance to hear from all of you and I've taken it in and I'll take it back with me with my work that I do in my community and I'll, you know, take what I learned tonight. But when, when I told my story and I talked about my, my transformation and where it took place, I, the, the key part was it started with me. It started with me making that commitment, me wanting to do better, me wanting better out of life, me wanting change, me wanting growth. So I would, I would just say to everyone 
um, that's participating here tonight that change does start with you. Um, if you want to see change, you have to be the change that you want to see. Um, that is my closing thought. I want to give each of the panelists a chance to um, just say some final words to our um, people that tuned in with us tonight. And I'm gonna start, um, Flo, since we finished off with you, I'm gonna go ahead and start with you and then we'll move down the road. Closing thoughts. Um, gosh, I mean, I think tonight was just really um, amazing. So I just wanna thank all of my panelists for being here um, and for really sharing wisdom about how to show up how to engage in these topics, um, how to, you know, how to hold space for the importance of, of these issues, um, you know, how to connect them to more global issues so we don't end up siloing ourselves because that's so often what happens um, and recognizing, you know, that, you know, the generational trauma is happening everywhere, that these things, there, there are common themes among our humanity. Um, and one of the tools I think of white supremacy is this idea that we are in competition with one another. Um, and it creates this way that we're not finding ways to uplift one another, but we're, we're thinking, well, my issue is more important than yours. And I, I think a lot of people have said it very eloquently that, you know, the oppression Olympics is one where nobody wins. Nobody, so this is not the way to go about it. We really do, we need to be honest about what's happening. We can call things out, but also we need to be in really strong um, co-conspirator and comradeship with one another. And so that that is my takeaway. It's a real honor to have been on a panel with people who I deeply respect um, and the work that LC, LCHC and Long Innovating Partners and Anti-Recidivism Co Coalition and even, you know, Assemblymember McCarty is doing in the um, in you know the uh, the legislature is is so important um, and it's a it's just a real honor to have been here tonight and I I think we are definitely like that fist stronger together and so I can't wait to see what other good trouble in the words of John Lewis we're ready to cook up next. Yes, yes, ma'am. So glad that I got the chance to uh, be a part of this with you tonight as well, all of you. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move on to Goia. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think just to close out, I just want to share my favorite quote, which is really similar to Devante's. It's, um, I, I never know if it's like from Jude Jordan or somebody else, but um, it says that, you know, I am the one that I've been waiting for. So don't wait for nobody. If you feel it, you think it, it's in your gut, do it, you know, um, and uh, we, we need you to be the one that is taking action. Um, and if, you know, for my mom and Southeast Asian folks who are on here, if y'all are already not involved, you should definitely hit hip up and let us know that you want to get down with us. Our team is way small, um, but we need more folks and we need you to be a part of this work with us. Um, so I welcome you and thank you so much to all my panelists and major love and props to Devante. You just did a phenomenal job and I really appreciate um, just your skills to be able to flow all of us through the end of the, the uh, discussion. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Like I said, the pleasure and the honor is all mine. Um, since we're moving with the flow with the ladies, let's go ahead with Ellen. Thank you, Devante. Um, again, I am in so much admiration of all the panelists who spoke tonight. I feel honored to be here and to, you know, share all of your perspectives. I agree, um, we're so much stronger together and I really appreciate hearing from everybody. I appreciate your motivation and inspiration, Devante, and sharing your story. Um, and I wanted to go back for just a minute and touch on um, something Kariga said in just reflecting about um, our incarcerated brothers and sisters right now and where we're at in this movement and thinking about, you know, with, with the combination of COVID and of the um, second pandemic of racism happening in America, really thinking about, you know, eight out of the 10 largest clusters of COVID have been in prisons. And so right now it's wonderful that we have 8,000 um, formerly incarcerated people returning to the community, but also thinking about how much work we have to do. Already there's so many legal restrictions 
up against people who are formerly incarcerated with regard to jobs, housing, educational opportunities. And so really being able to um, divest in, in policing and in, in uh, criminal systems and instead to invest in our communities, which means schools, public health um, and mental health. And I'll end on just saying with self-care, I agree, you know, setting boundaries, taking care of ourselves, making time to go outside and do what we want, but also checking in with our mental health. So, you know, seeing a therapist, there's so many virtual platforms right now to tap in and get mental um, health support. So really taking advantage of that as well. Again, thank you so much to everyone who's here tonight. Yes, thank you, Ellie. Appreciate you for being with us as well. Let's move on to Dr. Jeff, closing thoughts. Thanks, Avante. Um, so a couple of things. Uh, number one, fill out your census form. We are, California is on track to potentially lose a member of Congress and literally millions of dollars um, in federal funds. Make sure to do that. Make sure to register to vote and vote. Um, and um, definitely pay attention to those local and county elections. We, want, we need people in there that look like us, reflect our values, um, and, and are making decision, decisions on behalf of all of our communities. We're still in the middle of a pandemic. Wear a mask, wash your hands, keep physical distance. This thing has not gone away. And we're, um, this week, we're seeing spikes like all over the state. So definitely um, continue um, to uh, practice those preventative measures. And then also end with a quote, um, and which I think kind of reflects um, all the issues that we were talking about um, during the panel today. Um, and injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So we need to be united um, and do all this work together. So we're, I'm here for you, our organization is here with all of you um, and really um, privileged uh, to join um, all of my fantastic panelists. And uh, thank you for the great conversation. Yes, thank you. This was certainly history in the making. And last but certainly not least, Assembly Member McCarty. Uh, thank you for having me and um, thanks for allowing my kids to come in here and make sure that I was taken care of for this last 90 minutes. You know, I, I learned a lot um, just listening to you and, and I'll say that I, I'm your representative. This is a representative democracy here at our state capitol and I need all of you um, to make it work. And sometimes my job is is, uh, is super hard. I feel it's lonely when I'm fighting these fights and don't have enough people helping. So what can we do is just keep at it. And uh, we need to really, you know, expand our, expand our base. We have, um, you know, core people who've been fighting for this on this call and throughout our communities, throughout our networks, but we need to expand our allies. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you firsthand, I, I'm in the capital where I see votes happening. And when people get pressure from, you know, uh, the, the Jewish Women's Club on police reform, literally they're, they're, they're engaged on these issues now, or, you know, a neighborhood association that really wasn't involved with this. It really helps the case for, for us to bring about systemic lasting change. And so let's continue to, to expand our, our, our reach on this. And, and um, you know, it is hard. We want change right away. You know, I'm very impatient in politics. I want things to happen right away. Um, you know, I, I, I want to go fast on my own, but I realize too, like that African proverb, if you want to go far, you go with others and we need to make sure that we get, get on this together. And, but you, you also too have to, to remind yourselves that you can't beat yourselves up and, and feel like you're a failure, you didn't get it right away. Cause some of these things take years. Like for example, my first year in the assembly, I introduced the bill on independent investigations for deadly force. And it's been now five years and this is my third try and it's going to happen this year my fingers crossed. So some of these things um, take time. And so you need to think about things like self-care and how do you calm yourself down and remember, um, you know, you're trying as much as, you, as much as you can, but you know, you have to be a little bit realistic and realize your strengths and limitations as well. So uh, that's important for everybody. And I need to remind myself about that. So thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Flo for, for <laughs> reminding me as well. But anyway, I, I appreciate all of you and I uh, enjoyed spending this last 90 minutes and let's, uh, let's keep at it working together. Yes, sir. I appreciate those closing thoughts, Assembly Member McCarty. I want to also invite all of the panelists to participate in the debrief. 
uh, right after this. Um, and with that being said, thank everyone who tuned in tonight for this amazing panel. Let this please serve as knowledge and a motivation for you to go out and do the work that is necessary to um, impact and have change in your community. Um, with that being said, we are at the end and thank you all for tuning in. I'll see you all when I see you. All right. Devante, you were amazing. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um